my name is Elisa Steele, and you are joining us for Deconstructing the Culture. Today, I have the honor of introducing you to Ali Stuckey, the conservative millennial. And Ali Stuckey is the post, excuse me, host of the podcast Relatable, where she breaks down ladies in culture, news, and politics from a Christian conservative perspective. She is a frequent guest on Fox News, a writer and author of a book to be released in the spring of 2020. Super excited about that. In 2015, Allie begins speaking to college sororities on the importance of voting. Then, what started out as a hobby soon turned into a full-time career, and her blog, The Conservative Millennial, launched her into a political media career. So, from there, in podcasting and writing and making the occasional satire video, which has gone viral, Ali speaks to colleges and organizations about the importance of conservative values. Ali Stuckey, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And I kind of just want to know, how did politics first enter your life? Were your parents involved at all? Kind of. Well, my dad was involved in college. He uh, became a state representative for Texas, of course, a Republican when I was in college. But before that, we weren't a super political family. We didn't sit around the dinner table talking about politics. Now, I do remember growing up watching the news. I remember when I was, I think, in second grade is when the Bush Gore election happened. And I remember really caring about that. So I've always kind of had this uh, innate interest in what is going on in the world. And I've always been a conservative. I just never had one of those phases where I kind of questioned my conservative values or whether or, or when I wondered whether or not this was the best option. I've just I've always been a conservative and not because, like I said, my parents talked about politics in particular, but because of the values that they taught us, particularly about the American dream and they're both entrepreneurs. So I always had this idea and I probably didn't even know it was like capitalist or conservative, but I always had this idea that in America and only in America, uh, you can do pretty much whatever you put your mind to. And I was always just really inspired by that idea. I just always loved the idea of independence, of uh, flexibility and work and being able to do what you want to do. And I knew that America was the only place where that was possible. So that kind of just love for my country and love for the conservative ideal, love for the Constitution and things like that probably spurred or pushed me into what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. But there was never an overt um, political involvement in my life until I actually started speaking on college campuses in 2015. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that wasn't for quite some time later. When you were in high school and college, did you have an idea as to what you wanted to do? Because you're, you're, it's kind of sounding like that was a surprise for this to kind of happen later in your life. Kind of. So I knew that I wanted to speak in front of people. I always knew that. And I, I knew that I was interested in doing television, but I didn't have any concrete plan to get there. So I majored in communications when I was in college. I thought about maybe going to law school, but as much as I was interested in the subject matter I was learning about in college, I didn't have any desire to go to three more years of school. <laughs> and so I, the really, the reason why I started speaking on college campuses, um, is because in 2015, I was in a job, I was in PR, and it was fine. I'm so grateful for the first job that I had. But I remember sitting in my apartment thinking, okay, I have all of these dreams about being in media one day. I have all of these dreams about speaking in front of people. I've always loved speaking. I gave my college commencement address. And I remember thinking when I was giving that address, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I just remember sitting in my apartment thinking, why do I even have these dreams? I'm not even do, I'm not doing anything at all to pursue them. And that's kind of when I started having this idea. Well, what is stopping me from speaking for free on college campuses about something that I'm genuinely concerned with and genuinely interested in? And that was that young people, millennials at the time, millennials are no longer in college, we're all older than college. But at the time, it was around college age. And I lived in a college town. And I was like, you know what? A lot of these young people who are very educated, very smart, very well spoken, aren't voted in the primaries. They have no idea what's going on in the primaries. And if they are, if they are, they tend to be liberal. And I, I lived in Georgia and I, you know, it's pretty, pretty conservative state and conservative area. And yet I realized that kind of 
the more uh, or the less people knew about politics and the less people read, the less people were interested, the more liberal they tended to be. Mm -hmm, It's easy mm -hmm. to be liberal. And so I just started calling uh, sororities and finding like the president of the sororities uh, online. I was in the area of UGA and saying, hey, can I come speak at these sororities for free? And, um, and just talk about why you should vote in the primaries. And it was nonpartisan because I knew I had to be nonpartisan to actually get there and be invited back. And so I just gave this like Prezi presentation, still had my full-time job <laughs> and everything, just saying, I tried to make it like, you know, as relatable as possible. Uh, this is why you should vote. And I started doing that. And I just knew as soon as I started, even though I was getting, you know, I wasn't getting paid, no recognition. I wasn't like, at this point, I didn't have anything on the internet. Nothing was recorded. So nothing was going viral. Nothing like that. I just, I just got so much energy and um, uh, so much energy and affirmation, internal affirmation from yeah. doing that, that I just knew, I just knew that I was going to keep going. Wow. Um, and so I did. That is amazing. And now we have your amazing presence in today's world. So thank oh, you for thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I am kind of curious. You started with the name conservative millennial. Millennials yes. today get a really bad rap. Honestly, yeah. they're non-committal. They're not hardworking. They're entitled. Yeah. Do you feel like that we deserve that name or that reputation for millennials? Or do you feel like that's I think, overwrought? Well, I think in some ways we do. And when I first chose the name the conservative millennial, it was, it worked because it was such a paradox. Now, since the 2016 election, we've had quite a few conservative millennials come out and have a voice and start their own platforms, which I think is great. It's now seen, which I think is such a wonderful development, but the term conservative millennial isn't quite as scandalous and as radical as it was right after Obama was president for eight years, because mm -hmm. the idea was that all millennials were entitled, all millennials wanted big government, um, all millennials are increasingly secular and are socialist. And so the name, the conservative millennial was supposed to be a paradox, and it was. Now, thankfully, it's kind of lost its... Um, it's lost Better its taste. yeah it's yeah. lost its radicalness in a little in in a way which is why I don't really I don't really use it anymore I, I I like it but it's not you know primarily what I do and it doesn't have the same oomph that it used to um I do think that we have done conservative millennials and not even just conservative millennials just educated millennials people millennials who aren't apathetic and entitled have done a good job of pushing back on that stereotype a stereotype that I do think that a lot of millennials do deserve. I mean, if you look at the statistics, we are increasingly secular. We are increasingly selfish in the way that we look at policies and the way that we look in the, at the world. Really, everything is dictated from truth to our entertainment. Everything is dictated and centered on what we want and our personal preferences. That's why we often, millennials often get confused between privileges and rights because we think that we are entitled to the things that we yeah. want. We think that we deserve the things that we prefer and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that is because how we were raised. Like we were raised by baby boomers that's who true. wanted to give us a better life. And you know, they were well-intentioned, but they decided, okay, for some of them, they said, okay, I had a hard life growing up, my parents, you know, they, uh, I'm talking about in, from my parents' perspective, they're thinking, okay, my parents came out of the Great Depression after World War II, their life was hard. Uh, a lot of baby boomers were poor growing up and they had to, you know, start working when they were 15 years old to put food on their own table. That was true yeah, for both of my parents. And they were able to become successful in the 70s and 80s. And so when they had us in the 80s and 90s, they said, I don't want my kids to struggle like that. We don't and want so, that thing pain on their shoulders because they feel like exactly. it scarred them and they're trying to spare us of that scarring now. Exactly, exactly, which is a wonderful intention. But that's also how you got this phenomenon of helicopter parents, that's of true. baby boomers <laughs> who said, you know, my parents, they weren't there for me as much. They had to work two jobs. Like my dad's mom, for example, had to take classes at night while she was working full time during the day when he was young. He started at 15 just to, you know, pay for his own car, pay for his own books, pay for his own food oh, and yeah. you know a lot of parents decided I don't want my kids to go through that I'm gonna always be there for my kids no matter what so really good intentions but because of that I think a lot of millennials did grow up with this idea that it's it's all about me 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, agreed. Nope, I watched, I mean, not watched, obviously, I was I was not born, but I've, I've heard the same stories from my own parents. My mother's had to start working at 14, and she yeah. basically lived and was responsible for herself from 14 and up, and, you know, obviously, there was a little bit of different background with her. She was also from a cult and had 42 siblings, but still, it was that same, wow. it was that same difficult, um, back-breaking childhood and teenage yeah. childhood that she wanted to spare her own children, so. Exactly. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, we talked a little bit about um, how culture is changing, obviously, with millennials. How do you feel about traditional gender roles in today's world? Because I feel like that is changing a lot, what is and isn't acceptable. I know that you're married and that you are pregnant with your first. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I'm curious to hear what do you feel about, how do you feel about traditional gender roles and more specifically men staying at home being providers, women who are in the workforce today. There's a lot of controversy if you say, you know, women should be at home, then, oh my goodness, you want, you know, her barefoot in the kitchen with a baby on her hip. If you say women should work, then, oh, you're neglecting your children. How do you feel about those traditional gender roles and and where we're at today? Yeah, well, speaking from someone who is a Christian and in the Christian sense does believe in the biblical definitions of, of, of marriage and the biblical definitions of gender roles, I'm also a what I would consider a career oriented and ambitious person who has loved making a career for myself and having my own pursuit and having a husband who is behind these pursuits and is always excited about the things that I'm doing. Um, but my husband and I also have a, an, an understanding that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, even though I work really hard and I make money as well, and we are also dependent on, on my salary, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to him to make sure that our family stays afloat, that the ultimate responsibility for the safety and the provision of, of our family falls on him. It falls on the father. It falls on the husband. That doesn't mean that I'm not allowed to work. It doesn't mean that I have to be barefoot in the kitchen with a baby on my hip. But it does mean if one of us has the option, if one of us has to work, like we're in a dire situation where one of us uh, can't work, but one of us has to work, which I don't really know the real life situation in which that would be true. um, It's going, it's going to be, it's going to be him. And that's not to say there are zero situations in which men stay at home uh, with the family and that women uh, go work. There are situations in which that happens. And I don't think that the Bible says, Oh no, that, that, that can't work at all. I think there are situations, but the important thing in our family is that my husband knows is that at the end of the day, that ultimately the responsibility to lead, to take care of, to protect our family falls on him. And I think that that's really important to understand. And all women, whether they say they are feminists or not, want that. The, I, I deep think, down, I, deep down, yeah, no, they I, I believe they it. want that security. Yeah, they, they don't want someone who is going to point their finger at them and tell them what to do and how to be. For example, I dated a guy in college for a long time that in my mind, I was like, okay, um, you know, he'd be a great guy for me to marry. Ultimately, the reason that we broke up for aside from God's providence, thankfully, I'm so glad that I ended up with the husband that I have now. But Towards the end, he had a completely different idea of what he wanted for a wife. He didn't want his wife to have a full-on career. And I wow. I knew that something, I knew that something for me that I wanted, and my husband is always uh, behind me, but we just have a very clear understanding of at the end of the day what the man's um ultimate role is. Now, of all of that said. There are differences between men and women that make men better at certain things. For example, I did a whole podcast on women being in combat. Women should not be in combat. That's they somewhere I definitely combat. agree with you. And I yes. have friends, women friends who have been in combat. So it's, that's tough for me to say, but I 100% agree. Yes. And I've talked to women in com, or I've talked to women in the military who say you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just looking at the scientific facts. I mean, the Marine Corps uh, did a study. Yeah, did a study a couple of years ago, and they compared the gender integrated squads uh, to the all male squads. And in every single thing, whether it just had to do with lethality or accuracy, or whether it had to do with speed and strength, the all male squads uh, dominated the female and male squads, just because females are unable to do the same things physically as a man can. Now, there are some things that women do better than men. There are some things that women do equally to men. I think women are great leaders. We see that throughout the Bible, particularly Proverbs 31 woman. She's got a whole lot of responsibility (laughs) and she is busy throughout the day. Women are not supposed to be sitting on their hands idle all day. That's just not what God calls us to do. Um, 
So what I believe is in a complementarian relationship in which we acknowledge the unique strengths that men have that women shouldn't pretend that we have, like being in combat, for example, or having the ultimate responsibility at the end of the day, if you can afford it to provide and protect your family. Mm -hmm. Um, and the unique role that women has, we are better communicators in a lot of ways. We are better nurturers. We are better nourishers. We are better at beautifying uh, the world around us. And we are good leaders when we use our own strengths, not when we try to be men. Um, so if that is traditional, then yes, I, I guess, I guess that's uh, traditional. Of course, I do believe in biblical definitions of men and women and gender roles, but there is more nuance to that than uh, most critics of the biblical worldview would set, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, that does, absolutely. And I, I love that you you paint such a clear picture of what the Bible says, and then also how that contrasts to the world. And I've seen that firsthand on both sides. I've seen, you know, the crazy feminists who, oh, I won't stay at home and, you know, revolt anything that has to do with being a homemaker. But then I've also seen the other side because of my family background, because of the cult that I come from, I have dear loved ones, and I, and I won't go into details, but I have dear loved ones who literally, their father wouldn't let them leave home at all, and they were 20 yeah. years old, and they were not allowed, like truly not allowed to get a job or do anything outside of cook, clean, and, and look for uh, a husband, and so I know that people yeah. think that doesn't exist today. It does, not not to a huge extent, but I have seen both sides yeah. of that, so I love the picture that you paint of, of what does the Bible say, yeah. so... Speaking of that, I, I have another question for you, too, that has um, a lot to do with Christianity. How, how do you feel like today's mainstream church or Christian church should talk about same-sex attraction and gay marriage? Because I personally hold the belief that we don't talk about it maybe as much as we should or as um, clearly as we should. But I kind of want to get your opinion on that and how should that should be addressed in churches, if it should be addressed in churches or in what place. And um, just, I guess, how that messaging, how you feel like th that messaging is, is in America, good yeah. or bad? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really difficult topic because when you're talking about sexuality, you are talking about what people, particularly in the LGBT community, consider to be their identity. That this is not just a, we're not just talking about behavior, we're not talking about addictions, that uh, we can see our deleterious to someone, for example, like alcoholism or something like that. We are talking about what someone considers is their identity. They think that this is who they are and how they are defined. And so when we talk about the Bible's definition of marriage, which is very clearly only between a man and a woman, um, it is extremely offensive. And I want to sympathize with people who are offended by that rather than just say, well, you shouldn't be offended. No, I totally understand how that is offensive to you. I think the first thing that the church has to has to do and Christians have to do is try to explain that there is a distinction between your sexuality and who you are, at least according to the Bible. And that's a beautiful thing um, that you are not reduced to your sexuality, whether you are gay or straight, you are made in the image of God. And because of that, you have a soul. And because you have a soul, you have an eternal destination. And because you have an eternal destination, you have a purpose that is so much bigger than the person that you are attracted to or the person that you feel like you want to have sex with. So first, we need to um, separate identity as a human being and also and sexuality. Then we can isolate the sexuality and talk about it for what the Bible says that it is. It's a sin. Um, and just like other sins, it's not exactly the same as other sins because Paul says that sexual sin is different because you're sinning against yourself. Yeah. But um, just like other sins, it has to be dealt with. Uh, God asks us or Jesus asks us uh, to die to ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow him. That is not a call primarily from being gay to being straight or primarily from being a liar to telling the truth. Yes, with sanctification, all of our sins and all of our fleshly desires must die. But the primary repentance uh, that you are experiencing when you become a Christian is from unbelief to belief. It's from being dead in your sin, whatever that sin was, whether it was lying or whether it was some kind of sexual sin, uh, being dead in your sin to being alive in Christ. And it is that identity change that then affects your actions, no matter what they are, and even affects your desires. There is a mistake that a lot of Christians make. The cop-out is, well... 
you know what, it, it's fine. Whatever desires you have are fine as long as you don't act on them. But that's not what the Bible says about sexual sin. The Bible actually goes to the heart and says, no, these are actually dishonorable desires. And we see that with Jesus too. It's not just, okay, if you uh, don't commit murder, you're fine. He says, no, if you hate someone in your heart, that is murder. The same thing, it's not just about committing adultery to Jesus. He says that if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. And so mm -hmm. we see that it's on a heart level that Jesus wants repentance. It's not sufficient for the church to just say, think and want and imagine and fantasize and lust after what you want as long as you don't do it. No, that is denying the power of the gospel that transformed from the inside out, that once that belief is sparked, once you are justified in Christ, sanctification happens. There are two people that I think are wonderful examples of this and just have such powerful testimonies. Uh, Christopher Yuan, uh, Dr. Christopher Yuan, I encourage everyone listening to read his book, Holy Sexuality. I also interviewed him on my podcast a while ago and just talked about his amazing testimony of uh, being in jail and finding Christ in jail. And before he actually beget, got saved, he realized, oh my gosh, I can't be a Christian and live out my homosexuality at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really amazing. And then also Rosaria Butterfield, who uh, is an incredible Christian woman who also has an incredible testimony. I mean, she was far left, a gender studies professor. She uh, was with one woman for about 20 years, and then she gave her life to Christ. And uh, things change. Things change. Yeah. And I, I'm not talking about people say, oh, conversion therapy or pray the gay away. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about that. I'm talking about the power of Jesus that has the power to change all of us, no matter where we are sexually, no matter where we are with any kind of our sin. And I think that's the message that we need to be telling people. And also, which I think the church has gotten better at this part, but the church also needs to um, make clear that, uh, that being gay or having same-sex attraction or having any kind of sexual sin is not more of a sin. It doesn't make you dirtier in God's eyes than other sin does. It's not like, oh, you are real. If you're a non-Christian who is gay, you are really simple. That's not true because the Bible says that before Christ, we're dead in our transgressions and That's there are true. no degrees mm -hmm. of death. There's not any degrees of death. You are dead or you're dead. Dead means dead. And so for all of us, no matter what the sin is and no matter how good we think we are and how biblical our life looks, Apart from Christ, you are dead in your sin. And all of us have to be called from being dead to being alive through Christ and the sanctification through the Holy Spirit that happens is uh, able to change absolutely anything. Amen. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> and on that last note real quick, um, I want to ask you, you talk a lot about myths and Christian myths, and I know there's a lot of them, but if you had to pick one, what do you believe is the most widespread or widely believed Christian myth? Uh, they, I know that might they, be a tricky you know, one. They change kind of as culture changes. I think the idea right now, oh, there's, there's so many like tied into one idea, but this idea that- um, You could just- pick prosperity gospel <laughs> yeah it. yeah you could because the prosperity gospel I mean it really manifests itself differently uh among certain people so like with our parents the prosperity gospel was or you know the Joel Osteen prosperity gospel was God wants you to be happy and to make money he wants yeah. you to get that promotion he wants you to be healthy and okay we all know that that's not true there are very godly people who are poor there are very godly people who die of cancer so okay that goes away. Plus, yeah. it's, you know, it's not biblical. And then there's this other new prosperity gospel that you see from a lot of the feel good, charismatic um, word of faith Christians. That is God wants you to feel good about yourself. That's the new prosperity is, girl, if you just wash your face and you wake up and you look at the mirror and you say, I am awesome. I am Beyonce. Jesus loves me so much. Then that's it. that's all that God wants for me. He wants you to just feel good about yourself, and so He wants you to so, know that you're enough. You're enough yes, just the way you are. You're enough, girl, and you are perfect. And there is no need for repentance. And they also say there's no guilt, there's no shame, girl. Don't call something a sin. God has more to worry about. And in that way, and putting yourself in the center of the biblical narrative rather than Christ in the center of the biblical narrative, you find yourself compromising on a lot. 
You find mm-hmm. yourself compromising on a lot of theological issues simply because it, it feels good. It's more comfortable. No one, for example, if you put yourself, if you put yourself in the center of the biblical narrative, no one who does that is going to say what the Bible says about biblical marriage. Like mm-hmm. no one's good, going to say what the Bible says about gender roles. No one's going to say what the Bible says about Jesus being the only way, the only truth, the only life, because those are uncomfortable. And the new very uncomfortable. The gospel is that you just need to be comfortable and feel good about yourself. And as long as you do that, you're doing good. And nothing could be further from the truth. And it makes me sad. You're missing out. You're missing out on the power of the gospel in your life and the joy that comes from emptying yourself. So that would be yeah. the most easy way. Yeah, nope. I would say that's definitely at least the most widely believed one right now. And yeah. the one you'll see the celebrities touting. So one last very quick question. And yeah. then I want people to know how they can get a hold of you for speaking engagements or other. Yeah. The first quick question or last quick question, I should say, is what do you feel like is the most controversial thing you've done or said since coming into the public eye? Oh, probably. I mean, probably my stance on marriage, I, I would say. Um yeah, the one that it, came to mind for me was the uh, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez uh, mock interview you did a few months ago. That yeah, that was crazy. controversial. That's true. That um, yeah, that was really controversial because I don't know conservatives aren't allowed to tell jokes or something like that, and it, they ran with the narrative that I meant to deceive people, that I Ugh. was trying to trying to trick people with my editing skills hilarious because the editing skills were rough uh as far as backgrounds the backgrounds had nothing to do with each other yeah which was the point it's like we weren't trying to make it perfect but gosh people people will believe what they want to believe that was quite the experience for me but it was fun it's one of my favorite videos that I've ever done and like whatever it got me a lot (laughs) your your marriage stance that was super radical well it's it hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention yet, but I definitely had people reach out to me and say, you know, you Christians like you are the reason why I can't be a Christian because today seeing, you know, being someone who advocates for traditional marriage and biblical marriage and biblical gender roles is seen as extremely bigoted. It's totally fine to believe in the Bible. The left says, as long as you don't actually believe it. So, yep. Yep. Ali Stucky, thank you so much. Lastly, thank where you. can people get a hold of you? Uh, is there yeah. an email or somewhere they can reach out to you if they'd like to bring you to speak? Yes. So my email is in my Instagram um, profile, Ali B. Stucky. But if you just want to jot this down, it's Ali at the conservative millennial blog.com, which is a really long email. So Ali at the conservative millennial blog.com. It's two L's, two N's. Of course, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. And so you're welcome to contact me there or on Instagram. But for speaking engagements, um, definitely email is best. Got it. All right. Thank you so much again for joining me. Thank you, Elise. Check out Ali's profile. Check out her social media. She's killer. And she does a really amazing Instagram story. So thank you again. And have a blessed day. Thank you.